Great. Thank you so much. Okay. We can go through this one. Uh, uh, lots of thanks to our faculty. Uh, we're grateful for your efforts on these echoes. And we hope you'll be carrying with us into 2024, which we are intending uh, to keep the echo going uh, through next year, which will be the final year of mom CMS funding. But what's really exciting is mom is in the process, main mom is in the process of be becoming a main care service. Um, so we can go through these slides. Oh, yeah. Great. So today we're really appreciative to Tanisha Lovejoy and Maggie Jansen for doing our didactic for us. We'll be turning it over to them in just a minute or two. And then we um, have a case presentation today from Maine Health. Thank you very much um, from the Stevens Memorial and Western Maine teams. And Aaron is going to do the case presentation for us today. Aaron Olmstead. Just a reminder to everyone that ECHO is participatory. We really desire and value your engagement. Um, please put your cameras on when you speak, if you're able to. If you're able to put your camera on for the case presentation and um, the interactive sessions, that would be great as well. We might mute you uh, if we're getting background noise. Um, so if you're having problems speaking, please ping Mariah in chat and we can make sure you're unmuted. And just a reminder, Echoes and All Teach, All Learn Forum, we're really all here developing a community of practice together, learning from each other. We do have this amazing faculty, um, but we also have everybody who's a participant with incredible expertise um, to bring to the sessions. And let's go through these slides. Um, this is just the CME slide on disclosures. I don't think we have anything to report. There will be a CME survey at the end of the session, and Mariah will pop that into chat. So, Tanisha and Maggie, if you're ready, we'll turn it over to you. And thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, okay, great. Well, I'll um, do the intro. Um, it's uh, myself and Tanisha Lovejoy. Um, we are both nurses and nurse care coordinators for the main mom, our individual main mom programs. Um, I am the coordinator of the main mom program at Mid Coast Parkview Health in Brunswick. And Tanisha is the main mom um, nurse care coordinator um, in uh, Portland at Maine Med. And we have been asked um, today to talk to you about transitions of care for long-term SUD treatment. Um, and we will be reviewing the facilitators and barriers to successful transitions of care from patients who have been in Maine Mom um, to when they leave and go into long-term SUD treatment. Um, and we will also review the importance of predictability, stability in treatment, employment, and housing um, during that very uh, vulnerable phase of transition. Okay, next, next slide, please. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is talk about some of the facilitators to um, successful transitions of care um, from main mom to long-term SUD uh, treatment. And I should say that really, uh, as a caveat, um, we are, Tanisha and I will be talking today about what we see as nurses. Um, of course, all people, all providers come from different perspectives and Tanisha and I will be coming at this um, topic from a very nurse focused um, perspective. So please take that uh, with, with a grain of salt, but um, uh, what we, we we really feel like this this transition, a successful transition of care, does start first and foremost with um, a nurse care coordinator facilitating a good relationship between the patient and the main mom providers, whether that be MAT prescribers or women's health providers. Um, we do a lot of behind the scenes work 
We do frequent phone check-ins between visits. We troubleshoot issues um, that undoubtedly arise with pharmacies, with insurance providers, with transportation. Um, and we act as a sounding board for personal issues that come up, maybe during our phone check-ins, during the week, maybe when we room the patients. Um, we really have many more touches with the patient than the provider does throughout the weeks. And during those touches, we often can gather a lot of information along the way that we then share and pass along to the provider, which really helps to facilitate that relationship between the provider and the patient. Um, next slide, and I'll hand it off to Tanisha. Um, to continue the conversation on facilitators, Maggie and I, um, and we can't emphasize enough how important it is having a designated nurse that is familiar with this role, um, dedicated to this role, understands so much about like the, the psychiatric components as well. Um, and we're just really here to support them. Like that's that's what we do. Um, it takes away nothing from having any of the other nurses that used to try to handle these roles before I came in. I think that they probably did the best that they could. Um, but it really takes having someone designate it. Um, you know, as Maggie said, we just, we're their cheerleader. We we advocate, I mean, all the, it starts from like, I might advocate for something with Elaine and that goes all the way to like the OB provider or anyone, anyone that I feel I need to advocate for. It holds no, I'm there. Um, and I think that's the beauty of this is that as long as we know that the patient is always first, um, I will continue to advocate and it doesn't matter what I go up against. Um, they need somebody in their corner they can rely on and really commit to them. Um, treat, treating the patient's needs in the moment, you know, they don't always want to come and do the quote unquote regular visit. Sometimes they're in distress about a relationship issue. Sometimes they're in distress, uh, you know, food. You know, so maybe we're like running around this clinic getting food for them. And that is perfectly fine. That is what a visit is warranted at that point. We're engaging them. We're building our rapports and they know that we care. And then they leave. They come back next week. We'll finish business next week if, you know, if it permits. Um, but just keeping the flexibility in mind, really, that you need, um, you know, call in residential facilities while the patient is in clinic. We do that quite often. Um, we will set time aside. We will give them their own appointment to come in and do that. Um, you know, we run our clinic once a week, but Elise and I, I mean, I'm full-time and then Elise is um, also here three days a week. So I might make an appointment for them to come in when I'm here. Let's call some places. Um, and just knowing that like we can dedicate that time to them, you know, providing snacks in clinic. If someone's hungry, they're not going to be focused. And also it helps like um, if they have two appointments back to back and maybe there's some time in between, we've been known to give them cafeteria vouchers, go down there, get, you know, eat some food and come back. It keeps them here. Um, again, it's showing that we care. I, I care about you as a person, you know, um, filling out forms in the clinic that really some people just find to be like redundant, like named, like, but you know what? Not everybody has the space, the space, the mental space for that. Um, I don't always either. But the bottom line is, is that this is what I'm going to do for them because this is what they need at the time. Um, so, yeah. And then um, networking and engaging with the community is just so important. The folks that really support, you know, the folks that we're supporting. Um, I can't even say enough how those connections that we make is just, it might not be helpful right then and there, but it could be super helpful down the line. Um, you know, I think of this as like having more eyes on the ladies in the event that they fall out of treatment for whatever reason, maybe somebody in the community can pick that up and maybe eventually they come back around. You know, that's, I feel that very strongly with peer support as well. Um, like if we connect them with peer support, like, even though it's a different relationship, maybe they'll maybe they'll come back around, and that bridge is through maybe a peer support. So those connections are 
everything. And it also helps you call somebody when someone's in desperate need of a bed or, you know, whatever the case may be, they need to go home with this baby and everything lines up except for they have no place to go. Maybe you have, you made a connection. So that's uh, very, very important. Um, in a way, all of us providing care to the specialized population need to lean on one another for a variety of reasons um, and understanding that we all hold different roles, but all those roles are very powerful and to know when like you're, you're up and maybe you're, it's time for you to step back and let somebody else take that role. Um, next slide. Take that one. Um, okay, so another facilitator of care that I personally find to be really invaluable in my work um, is just to make sure that I'm working hard to connect our main mom patients to as many healthcare providers as possible, not just within the main mom universe, but throughout the entire healthcare system. Um, for example, setting all of our mid-coast main mom patients up with a PCP has been a goal of our particular program here. Um, we found that many of the patients who entered into our program either did not have a PCP when they entered or had not connected with their PCP for many, many years. Um, so during their time with us, one of our main, one of my main goals was to help facilitate many new um, primary care provider signups um, while they were with us. And we, we found um, a med peds provider in our system. And I would highly, highly recommend this if you are able to do this. If you can find a PCP in your system who has an interest in working with women who have substance use disorders, um, because we found one in our system. Um, he's local, he's in Brunswick, he's, he's got a real interest in working with, with these patients. And he's a med peds guy um, from Boston, and he wants to work with these dyads. And so he's been taking um, the moms and the babies. Um, and, and he not only works with them, but he's also now taking their partners, who a lot of them aren't in recovery yet. But he's starting to see them for a wide variety of their um, concerns. And by getting to see them and earning their trust, he's getting them into treatment slowly but surely with us. It's been really a wonderful partnership. So I would highly, highly recommend that. Um, it's just been a really nice community health slash integrative health approach for the entire family. Um, and as much as we, I feel like, you know, a lot of us have railed against the learning Epic and all of the, the things that Epic brings with it. Um, I have found that having the shared EMR system um, has just been a tremendous boon to creating a, such better communication and wraparound care for our patients in particular. It's And I feel like it's really important to take advantage of that ease of communication and use it to, to take and create better care for our patients. Um, for example, I was just in an MAT um, group before I came here, and we make it a point at each MAT appointment to ask our patients about birth control. Um, what birth control are you using? And if they're not using any and we know that they've just started a new relationship, we're going to ask that patient if it's okay if we, we send an in-basket message to their OB um, to, to see if we can get them in for a quick consult about birth control. Sometimes that OB might not be able to get them in, but that OB will call them and maybe can call in a prescription for them. Um, it takes me maybe two or three minutes to write an in-basket message to that OB on Epic. And that patient gets a phone call the next day and that patient sees that they're being cared for in a wraparound way. And I love it. And the patient really responds well to it. Um, and without fail, our patients always say yes to really having that that communication um, be done. So I, I've found that just to be excellent. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so it's like, like Tanisha mentioned before, it's so important to make sure our patients are having their basic needs met um, and to make sure that we're asking about those needs at each appointment. I really feel like that's where this nurse care coordinator role comes in. We, it's our job. I feel like it's my, my job um, to see the full picture of the patient, not just the SUD. Um, we need to see, sorry, let me just, uh, 
just hang up on that. Or we're going to see the full picture of the patient, not just the SUD, make sure that all their needs are being met. Um, we're going to have TANF applications available for them to fill out while they're waiting. Um, we're going to have, because while they're waiting, then they fill it out. We can have the clinic um, mail them for free. Um, we have, I have the local WIC um, clinic on my speed dial. As soon as a patient becomes pregnant, I know that I can call that WIC clinic and it takes me maybe five, 10 minutes to get that patient into the WIC um, system and they're enrolled. And then the WIC, um, the WIC cl clinician is calling them to schedule them. Um, and as soon as that patient is pregnant, they're eligible for WIC benefits. So that's something that I can easily do in my role. And um, it's something that we should be doing. Have flyers and the latest information available from local food banks. It's an easy thing. Have them out, ready to go, ready to hand out. Have all numbers for local domestic violence shelters and be ready to call with patients. I've done that several times and it, believe me, it helps. It helps to be there with them to, to call alongside them. Um, know how to access the list of current child care providers so that you can print out a list of places for them to call. There's not a lot of availability, but at least you can give them a list of people to call. Um, that they can walk out of here with to call later. Um, and and that link is right there on the screen. And I can share that with you later too, if you need to. Also have a list of up-to-date dental care providers that take main care so that they can walk out of here with places to call if they need that. Um, have snack bags, cafeteria vouchers. We have um, a, a closet downstairs full of diapers that have been provided to us by the local United Way diaper bank. Um, and anytime a patient comes here, we ask them if they need any diapers. Usually they do. So we walk down and give them a pack of diapers. Um, have stuff on hand ready to give out. Work with your local food banks. A lot of them have little bags of snacks that you can have here ready to hand out to patients. And then most important, make those peer support referrals. Um, offer them constantly. They might not be ready um, at the first go, but maybe by the third month, they're ready. You never know when they're going to be ready to take a peer support referral. But once they take it, I have never once had a patient say, oh, darn, I wish I hadn't taken that peer support referral. They're always so thrilled to have it and um, always have AA and NA lists, uh, local meeting lists available to hand out because I think it's so important to build up a recovery community for our patients as they as they enter into this next phase of their life. Okay, um, next slide, I'll hand it off to Tanisha. So barriers, um, we could sit here all day and talk about them as Maggie and I did offline leading up to this quite a bit. Um, the continued misuse of substances by the significant other, um, at times the significant other themselves. People have heard me talk about that before, um, but you know, at that conference, when I did mention it, she gave some great advice. And I, I think that is what we do. But inside, it's just this feeling of like, what, what else can I do? But I, I think that just, you know, hanging in there, supporting her in whatever way that is, that looks, um, is what we do. Um, and just being there. Um, unstable, unpredictable housing. Can't say it enough. Because honestly, when I think of and I don't want to use the word success, like you're only successful if you have this or that, because, you know, somebody in five days, two days of recovery is a success story in my in my eyes. But I will say the long term folks, and I think I listed maybe four of them that I can think of that have been pretty be consistent the whole time and um, kind of transitioning out are the folks that have stable housing. Um, it's just so detrimental and it's a problem. So um, difficulty finding reliable transportation. We find that a lot here because we are the hub of everything that comes in. And a lot of people don't live around here, um, but we're trying to keep them engaged. Eventually we are going to, you know, probably get them somewhere closer to where they live. But in the meantime, in trying to get them stable, like we try to get them here. Um, and that's in the form of an Uber. Um, it's been in the form of calling mode of care. And anybody who's ever done that knows that oh, it's not fun. Um, I, we have taken road trips. 
Ask Elaine. We've got in her car and we have driven there and we had like four or five clients um, at this facility. It was kind of snowy and we were like, well, let's go. So like, it's a challenge. You just have to figure, figure your way out around it. Um, lack of reasonably priced childcare. Maggie talked about this a little, but um, you know, without childcare comes, no, they can't seek employment. I mean, it even goes right back to like, what about if they want to do school or take some classes without childcare? That's, that's really tough. Um, uh, DHHS, DHHS involvement or the anticipated involvement is probably one of the biggest barriers um, that I see in my role here. Um, it scares them. They want nothing to do with it. They, they may have had pr previous interactions there and it didn't go well. Um, they're still in the thick of it and they're just they don't want to talk about it with people who who could potentially penalize them, even if that system is put in place to help them. They're just not seeing that. Um, so it's a huge barrier. And um, we continue to work to try to figure out ways to kind of just. I don't want to even use the word smooth because that's not the correct word, but to figure out how we can better connect all these systems. Um, Lack of access to other types of SUD treatment, methadone clinics. I mean, good Lord, I could spend a lot of time on this alone, but I won't. However, I just want to talk about um, a patient that we had that was doing so well. I mean, and if you would have met her in the hospital when she first arrived, it would have been like, wow, there's just, what are we going to do? But she was doing so well, um, went through a residential and then kind of went from there up to a recovery residence where she was going to be guest dosed on methadone until they could get her in. Well, long story, her methadone, she, she no longer could guest dose. They were like, you filled up your time guest dosing. And um, by the way, our waiting list is a year. So she had no choice but to leave that place, come back to this area. This area provided no good resources or her surroundings socially for her. And unfortunately, so there was a lot of factors, but unfortunately things didn't work out well for her. And I just feel like what a barrier that like, what a barrier that could have been prevented, in my opinion. Um, lack of other SUD clinics and providers in rural Maine that take Maine care. That's also tough. Um, I think that the Maine Mom program is trying to do things about that and get people engaged and get providers in other areas, but we're still, we, we, we still have troubles with that for sure in the rural areas. Um, you can go on to the next slide. Um, unreliable phone numbers. Well, if we can't get a hold of them, there's nothing that we can do. Um, so Elise and I at every visit and Maggie too, like you just have to review their best contact number. It's redundant. It doesn't matter. Um, and if they don't have a number or even if they do get the phone number of a contact person they trust, um, because once you lose that connection, it is really challenging, you know, um, it's very challenging. So just stay up on those um, prior negative experiences with healthcare, mistrust in the healthcare system. Like I feel like as nurses, we're building that every interaction I do, I am building a rapport. And with me comes healthcare, like with me comes the providers and comes everything else with me comes the DHS referral. So like the stronger we can make our bonds or whatever you want to call it, like the stronger we can be they have someone to lean on when they don't want to, when they don't want to deal with anything else. So I can't say that enough. Um, continued stigma in the healthcare regarding um, their SUD, like like Maggie had, had said earlier, maybe she didn't, but we've talked about it. Like sometimes we have to bulldoze people. Like, I don't like to always say that word, but it's the truth. Like if you see someone being treated poorly, Mm -mm, that doesn't sit right with me. And I'm going to say something, see something, say something, you know, anyway, so that we all have to be mindful of and look for um, untreated, undertreated co-occurring mental health disorder. Holy, like, you know, that will say what came first, the chicken or the egg, who knows, doesn't matter. They both have to be treated. And if you, if you're only focusing on one or you're just like tiptoeing around, like it's just... It's not going to work. So those two pieces have to come together in order for there to be success. Trauma came first. There you go. Okay, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, <laughs> next. And Maggie, I'll send that to you. All right. 
Yeah, this is just um, a big long quote from us, but basically this is this is our answer to um, the question of what's the importance of the predictability, stability, and treatment, employment, and housing during this potential vulnerable phase of tr transition. And so basically as Janice and I were talking over the our answer to this question, this is what we came up with. And, and it is when we both look back over our main mom patient cohorts over the years, the patients who've been most successful in maintaining their recovery as they've transitioned out of Maine Mom have been the patients who have found permanent housing during their time with Maine Mom or who came to us with an already tight network of family support with whom they were able to live with and feel safe with while entering and maintaining recovery. And then the other cohort that's been the most successful um, have been the patients who've made strong connections to other healthcare providers in the health system and continue to see those healthcare providers after they leave Maine Mon. And I can attest um, to that last uh, cohort um, in particular, I can give you an example. Um, one of our Maine Mon patients here at Midco, she is a young woman who was diagnosed with a rare um, sarcoma when she was approximately seven months postpartum. And at that point, she was a single mom um, living temporarily with family members um, after fleeing a violent relationship with her daughter's father. And we had worked closely with her um, to help her get out of that violent relationship as part of our main mom work with her. Um, but at the when she was diagnosed with her sarcoma, I began working closely with her to establish her oncology care, both... Um, in Scarborough, and then also in Boston at um, Mass General. And by the time she graduated from me, mom, she was so well connected with several healthcare providers, not only in Brunswick, um, with us, but also in Scarborough, and then also in Boston, um, that she was interacting with on an almost daily basis, that she was able to not only get to a point now where her daughter just celebrated her second birthday. She is now cancer free. She is nearing her three year recovery birthday. And is just in an incredible place um, in her life where she's just getting to to really experience wonderful things. And one of the things that she has told us is that the connection to these doctors and these nurses all the Northeast at this point, who have really looked at her as a person, not as somebody with an SUD, but as a person who they care about, who they checked in with, who they talked to, who they wanted to know how she was doing and how her daughter was doing and really cared about her. She felt really cared for and really taken care of um, during that, that really difficult time in her life. I think she credits that with really where she is today. And so, um, I just, I feel like that's a, a really cool story to show you that um, you can have a lot of other things going on in your life, but but having some um, real great connections in the healthcare system can make a huge difference. So keep up those connections. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, oh, no, go back. Got to do the golden rules. All right, Tanisha. All right. We're going to end here about the golden rules. Um, build build a relationship. Kindness matters more than you can ever imagine. I hope everybody in here understands that and knows that. We all don't have great days, but um, tap yourself out if you're not. Um, sharing smiles, laughter together goes a long way. Remember that each patient is so much more than their SUD diagnosis. Ask them about their whole lives. Uh, build a team of healthcare providers around your patient, as Maggie just stated. Help your patient build a recovery community by making those referrals. Connect your patients to as many community resources as possible. Remind your patients constantly of the power they have within themselves as women and as mothers that they are capable of great things. And you can be that believer for them even when they can't, but they will take that on. Um, don't be afraid to be a bulldozer for them from time to time. Show them that with action that you are their advocate and ready to help. And sometimes that comes in different forms. Not everybody appreciates, but it is what it is. So thank you. Hey, okay. yes. Questions, comments, suggestions. This is how you can reach us. Our emails, our names. 
Great. Thank you both so much. And um, Mariah, you can pop that recording button off and we'll just open.